This photograph was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts Christmas Eve, 1968. This is the first time that people had left Earth orbit and seen the Earth from afar, see the Earth just hanging there in space. And as they came around the moon, the Earth rose, just like we see the moonrise or the sunrise. And I remember watching it. I was eight years old, vacation in Miami Beach, we at the hotel, black and white TV, and watching the Earth rise over the moon. This photograph is called the Blue Marble, it was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts in 1972. And the sun happened to be placed just right when they were between the Earth and the moon to take a picture of the entire sphere of the Earth without any shadow. This is the first time that humans saw the entire Earth. And in 1972, around that time, was also when the environmental movement really got started. President Nixon started the Environmental Protection Agency. He had organizations like Greenpeace. There was environmental activism because people could see this is all we got and we got to take care of it. And now, when I grew up, you know, maps were just illustrations, globes were just illustrations. But after we've had these photographs and satellites, we're actually able to create maps that are created from many, many photographs. These are satellite photographs in this. This is not an illustration. And satellites, by the way, are also used with climate change because we can measure the ice melt, we can measure the temperature in the oceans, how much CO2 there is. So we use, actually, space is very important for looking back at Earth. So there's too much carbon dioxide, too much CO2 in the ambient air, in the air around us, and actually also in the oceans. And the problem with when you burn CO2 is, when you create CO2, is you can't see it. It's invisible. This camera, was developed by a com company called FLIR, they're in uh, Sweden. And this, this prototype here is almost 10 years old. Uh, they recently started putting these into production. And basically, it lets you see CO2. So here you have a car exhaust, and then through the camera, that's CO2. A car exhaust and CO2. And so if you want to do something about a problem, it's really great to be able to visualize it. So now we're actually able to visualize this. I mean, in other words, right now you're seeing this, and perhaps for the first time, you're seeing what CO2 looks like, at least if you look through this camera. Now, I used to work for a Danish oil and gas company. They had a carbon and climate department, and it was in 2008, 2009, in the lead up to the much anticipated and much more disappointing United Nations Climate Conference, COP15, that was held in Copenhagen. And one of the very first things I did was with a colleague. We went to uh, the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States because we wanted to do, examine carbon capture technology and biofuel technology. And that's where I met Klaus Lackner at Columbia University. And Klaus has been trying to uh, examine how you can take CO2 out of the ambient air. And actually, this material here is a resin that when it's dry, it's capturing CO2. And when you make it wet, if you put it in a glass of water or something, it releases the CO2. It's one little problem with it. It smells like rotten fish. Well, I'll hand out some samples. You can pass it around. And uh, please give them back to me afterwards. But here you go. And you can just pass them around. Thanks. Here you go. So this actually gives the possibility of taking the CO2 out of the air around us. In other words, the CO2 that we've already released, not what's gonna be coming out of smokestacks later, but, but basically what we, what we have. And this is an example of the same material, but where they try different configurations to get as much surface area. And this is sort of the chemical reaction between the dry and wet state of this to show, show, show to it how, it, how it actually works. And this is Klaus Lackner with his colleague, Alan Wright, and they created this little greenhouse. There are plants in there. And they took some of this material, and it's those little round circles sort of in the back in the middle there. And they were laden with CO2 because they'd just been standing out in the lab. And they put them in there. And actually, in this instance, they didn't even put them in water first because the air was quite damp in the greenhouse with the plants and the water that was already there. And they hooked it up to a computer. And the red line you can see down there, it was about a 360 parts per million. That's how you sort of measure CO2 in the air. 
And that was about what it was in, in the lab. And after half an hour, it had risen to about 520 parts per million. In other words, you can actually see the CO2 rising. And a little bit later, it started going down because plants, they like CO2. They started sucking up the CO2. So this, this works. Now, in 2012, I'm, I'm uh, part of the Climate Reality Project, so I'm trained by Al Gore, along with thousands of other people around the world, to give these climate presentations. And the Association of Swedish Engineers asked if I would give a presentation uh, to about 75 engineers and others uh, in Stockholm. It was at the Hilton in Stockholm, August of 2012. And I remember telling them that the ice is melting in Greenland, the ice is melting in the Antarctic, and sea level is rising. And if you just have a very little bit amount of sea level rise, if you have a storm that's pushing the water, you'll have much, much more flooding when it finally reaches land. And I remember telling them that cities like New York or London will get flooded. Not this year, but in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. I also remember telling them that the drought that had been taking place in Texas for the past or the previous three years would, within four years, uh, reach the Midwest of the United States, but actually at that point only taken four months. So in other words, that was a climate prediction by scientists where it happened a little bit faster. So this was August of 2012, and then I was on vacation in London uh, in, in the end of October 2012, two months later. And I remember watching the TV, watching CNN, and watching the reporter at the battery at the southern tip of Manhattan with the water coming up to her knees. It was Superstorm Sandy. And cars were floating in the streets of Manhattan. Who would have thought? And that was just two months later when I made my statement to those engineers in Stockholm. So basically, I started thinking, you know, we talk about reducing our emissions, you know, driving the cars less, taking the train, getting away from oil, using wind turbines and solar panels. That's all for our future emissions. You know, we're, we're using it now, but it'll be cutting our future emissions. But all the problems that we're seeing today, they're caused by what's already up there. And therefore, we have to start taking it out of the atmosphere, taking it out of the ambient air, taking it out of the air around us. So I went back to Klaus Lackner and I said, Klaus, you should really build a prototype of this and put this in production and build many, many of these. And he said to me, well, you know, David, people don't like geoengineering. Now, geoengineering is when you start doing things. For instance, if you take iron, iron ore, and you put it into the ocean, you can make the oceans less acidic. Or if you take particles and put them up into the air, you could start blocking the sunlight and cool down the planet. And I said to him, Klaus, we've been geoengineering the planet since 1750 when we started digging up coal and burning it, and then later on, oil and gas and burning it and heating up the planet. That's geoengineering. This is reverse geoengineering. This is to solve that problem. So Klaus is now, not a, he's not at Columbia University. A couple years ago, he went over to Arizona State University and set up a whole department for, to this. To, to investigate this. This is one of the prototypes for a specific application. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, if you're gonna wanna do this at large scale, because we're talking about if each unit of these can capture one ton of CO2 a day, you'd need 150 million units to really make a dent. Uh, if we figure that you can capture 60% of CO2 in the future from smokestacks, like factories and power plants, there'll be another 40% from lawnmowers and airplanes that will still have to be captured by this type of technology. And on top of that, we want to remove a lot of the legacy CO2, the CO2 that's already up there, that we've already emitted, that's causing the problems that we have today. And I started thinking about shipping containers, because we have an entire infrastructure around the world on, with shipping containers. You know, you can move them around, you could stack them. And if you sort of took this technology open up the sides, put this material in there and some carousels, capture a, a panel at a time, make it moist, capture the CO2 and let it spin around, then this is one way to do it. This might be a practical way to do it. Now, I figure you're not gonna build 150 million in one year, but you could build 15 million in one year, and after 10 years, you'd have 150 million, and then maybe you could start switching out the old models with the newer ones. We build about 80 million cars, passenger vehicles a year, in the United States, the EU, and China. And they're all different models. 
and they have a lot of technology crammed in. And this is basically building 15 million units using sort of the same template, just using the same technology across the board. But the thing is, if you did this, because what are you going to do, you know, who's going to pay for it, basically? And that's part of the problem, because we have to also think about what to do with the CO2. Uh, some people talk about pumping it underground in saline aquifers, some deep underwater lakes, but I'm not quite sure that's a good idea because we could see from fracking that if you put a lot of pressure underground, it causes earthquakes. And there could be fractures as well where the CO2 comes out of the ground again. But you could mineralize the CO2, turn it into a carbonate, basically turn the CO2 into a stone. Now, that could all be done in the lab, but it takes a lot of energy. So if we can figure out a way, an energy-efficient way, to capture the CO2, well, we capture it here, and then to, to turn it into a mineral, to turn it into a stone, then it's out of the system. Then it becomes sort of a carbon negative situation. So we could build these units here, but you don't start a company to build them because basically the CO2 is worthless. So companies or, or venture capitalists and others are not really going to invest in this because what are you going to do with that CO2? And if, we're, if you say that each unit costs $25,000 a piece, uh, you're talking about you know, somewhere close to half a trillion dollars, $500 billion a year that you're going to have to spend on this. And that could be governments doing that, because obviously if you stop the effects of climate change and you don't have to move cities like New York City inland or something like that in the future, that's going to cost a lot more than $500 billion, by the way. Uh, you could actually end up creating a lot of jobs, because if the EU is paying for this, what you could say is, we want to build this at a shipyard in Greece because we need to create jobs in Greece because the economy in Greece is really bad and it's a drag on the European economy, it's a drag on the world economy. And you could sort of decide, we're going to find a shipyard there and we can create 10,000 or 100,000 jobs. You can place jobs in Italy or Portugal or Spain, places where you can actually improve the economy. And we're talking about like 3 million jobs here. That you, that'd be permanent jobs. The United States could do it in places like Detroit or Flint, where they have car factories, and they have a lot of unemployed workers. And it may not be Washington paying for it. It could be the state of Michigan, because I think these days Washington is not going to pay for much. <laughs> and it can be places like West Virginia or Kentucky, where you have coal miners, and you put them to work building this instead of digging up coal. So there's a whole economic aspect to this, and not just saving the world, but there's a whole economic aspect. Another thing about this is, is that if you start taking CO2 out of the air, you reduce the relative pressure of CO2 on the oceans because the oceans have too much CO2. The oceans are acidic and marine life is suffering as a result. So if you take it out of the air, the oceans will start releasing their excess CO2 into the air, which we'll have to take out. So actually you might first see really a reduction of CO2 in the oceans before you finally see the reduction uh, in, in the air. We're at about 400 parts per million CO2 right now. We have to bring it down to 350 parts per million. That's sort of the technical part of it, but the, basically we have to get to something lower. Otherwise, we're going to start seeing, well, we're already seeing weird weather patterns and things, but storms and floods and drought and cities that get, that get flooded. Now, there are other companies working on this. There's carbon engineering in Canada. Uh, there's global thermostat in the U.S. There's Climeworks in Switzerland. Now, their technologies also use a lot more energy. This is a very passive technology. However, some of their processes are very efficient. So it could end up being that we figure out a way to do this, kind of combining some of the technologies to get the best solution. Now, one thing you could do before we figure out about how to efficiently mineralize or turn into stone the, the, the CO2 is that you could use it for greenhouses. This photo is actually taken from a greenhouse right outside of Odense. And some plants and some vegetables like more CO2. They grow faster. And I have a feeling that we're going to have to be using a lot more greenhouses because we have a lot of drought around the world and we have to start growing food. So in other words, we have to be careful about moisture and things like that. So this could be one of the applications. It's a carbon neutral application because you take the CO2 out of the air, you put it in the greenhouse and goes back into the air. But at least you're not creating the CO2 by taking fossil fuel and adding to the system. So basically... If we have a sort of understanding of the real problem that it's not just reducing our future emissions, but it's also that we absolutely have to remove CO2 
from the ambient air and also the oceans in order, you know, to, in order to solve the climate crisis. Uh, that's, that's one thing that we have to understand. The other thing we have to understand is the economics about it and that maybe spending hundreds of billions of dollars ends up being cheaper, certainly in terms of the damage coming from climate change, but also that we can create some economic opportunities and, and help some areas, regions that, that need that help. You know, going to the moon is really hard. My dad was a rocket engineer in the, in the early 60s. It was really, really difficult. This can all be done in the lab. We just have to sort of focus on putting it into production and looking at the economic aspects of it and getting governments to agree that this is the way to go. Thank you. Thanks.